Recording. Hello, welcome to week 11. Our topic this week is earthquakes. So let's dive into this. I'm just going to go share my screen here. Okay. So as I mentioned, our topic is earthquakes. Now, one thing you may be wondering before we dive into this is why are we considering earthquakes when we're in Minnesota? The largest earthquake ever recorded in Minnesota was a magnitude five way back, I think sometime in the 50s or 60s in the Browns Valley area. And I'm not sure what the interpretation of that one was. But if you think back to what we did and investigated when we were thinking about Minnesota geological history, imagine back in the Pinocchian orogeny. So at that point, we would have been at a major plate boundary. There would have been a multitude of high magnitude earthquakes. So just hold that in mind. Earthquakes are a key part of plate tectonics. So building your knowledge about them is really important. What are we looking at in this image that we have right here? So what you can see is what gets called a fault scarp. And, oh, bear with me, my mouse isn't connected. Just hold on a second here. Oh, well doesn't look as though it's going to get connected. All right. Um, so what we're looking at um, here is a place where there has been what's called ground displacement during an earthquake. And in this instance, it's related to one of the earthquakes in New Zealand in 2010-2011. So what we're going to do today is look at a ge general introduction to earthquakes, talk a little bit about earthquake waves and energy, instrumentation associated with earthquakes, and then we're gonna spend quite a while considering consequences of earthquakes. And we're going to dip into looking at faults and what we can learn about Earth's interior. So first of all, what actually is an earthquake and what happens during an earthquake? So on the left, you can see a text list. So an earthquake is when there's a release of energy, when what we call the strain on rocks is greater than their strength. So all earth materials have some kind of cohesiveness, or you can think of it as strength. And when they're being stretched or pushed, there is always a certain point where they just can't take it anymore and they crack or they fracture. And that is effectively what happens during an earthquake. The rocks can't take it anymore and they move and a lot of energy is released. And this can be on an already existing fault, or it may be a new fault. Um, that varies. Um, and just a reminder that the term fault refers to a plane of breakage in the crust. It's not always a simple flat surface. Often it's curved, maybe slightly sinuous. So if we look over to the diagram on the right now, you can see the word focus, this red dot, that's where the energy is released. And that energy moves out away from the focus in all directions as a series of waves. Now look at the land surface in the diagram. The point on the land surface immediately above the focus, and I should mention that sometimes the term hypocenter is used for focus as well. But the point on the land surface immediately above the focus is called the epicenter. And usually when you hear reports of earthquakes, people are talking about where the epicenter is because that's our frame of reference. And over on the left, there's some mountains and a fault scarp 
is identified. That's just the location of um, the physical break in the Earth's surface where that fault reaches the surface. So once we have an earthquake, a bunch of energy is released, that energy travels as waves through the rocks from the focus. And what we do to learn about the Earth is we record those waves of energy at instruments that are called seismometers. So on the left-hand side here, you can see there's some kind of contraption buried deep down in the bedrock. And what they're trying to portray with these funky lines here is some waves that are arriving at the seismometer. That seismometer is attached to um, another instrument up at the surface. And this instrument is the recording drum. Now, this is the way it all used to work. And it's actually easier to explain it like this. Now, all this happens digitally. Um, basically, there's a drum with a piece of paper on it that rotates. There's a pen charged with ink and the waves of energy, when they arrive, they make that um, pen move relative to the drum and we get a recording of the wave that arrives. So we've talked about release of energy. How much energy? Well, we measure earthquake energy. And this is really important to know. Um, not using the Richter scale. Whenever you hear newscasts, you will typically hear them mention Richter scale. No, um, that's old school. There is a new approach, and it's actually been used for 10 or 20 years now. It's called the method of, sorry, the method of moments. And it's broadly very similar to the Richter scale. The numbers don't look that different, but it actually includes a wide range of um, variables in its um, calculation, so including earth materials and um, the distance over which um, there has been movement and stuff like that. So when you hear people on the news talking about the Richter scale, they're behind the times. Now, here's just a nice visualization of how those waves move. Just imagine waves moving away from where you throw a rock into a still pond. Only instead of it being the pond surface, those waves are moving out in all directions. And we can record those waves. And the Earth um, responds equivalently. Um, closer to the epicenter and or focus, um, there will be more damage. Farther away, the waves get attenuated and there is usually, well, there will be less damage and less shaking, if you like. So just a brief um introduction to earthquake waves. There is a lot of information out there about these earthquake waves, so we're not going to dwell on it too much. There are two main groupings of waves, body waves and surface waves. We're going to look at surface waves first, actually. They also get love waves because the character that first described them had the last name love, and they move out from the epicenter um, as a complex rolling motion. So, and over on the right, there's examples. It sort of goes, whoa, what's happening? Um, side to side, and also this sort of um, rolling, you almost feel like you're on a ship and you're going to be seasick. Um, so surface waves are usually only felt um, relatively close to the epicenter, within 100 miles or so. Um, so they are not usually uh, of any import once you get farther away than that. 
but they can be very um, damage inducing close to an epicenter. Now, let's go back to our body waves. Um, they effectively are the waves that move through Earth's interior from wherever the focus is. And they're divided into the primary and secondary waves. And the primary waves or P waves are really fast. So you can think of them as the waves that will reach you wherever you are first. And what's important here, if we want to think about how can we use earthquakes to learn about Earth's interior is they move through solids and liquids. On the other hand, our secondary waves, which are slower, they um, only move through solids. So think back to when we were drawing our pizza slice of Earth and we had our outer liquid core. How do we know that? Bingo. We know it because we can look at the arrival of P waves and secondary waves. And um, the geophysicists can use that data to figure out where the mantle core boundary is, because those S waves basically won't go through the um, upper or outer liquid core. Okay. So a little bit more about instrumentation. So over here on the left, we've got our um, banks of drums. This is the old school approach. And you may wonder why, why are there three of them? That's because we are interested in motion that goes east, west, north, south, and up and down. And here we are looking at what is effectively a blown up trace of an earthquake. Um, normally, there'd be lots of lines going across left to right on this piece of paper. In this diagram, they've just singled out one of those. If you look over to the left, you can see all these. Well, in this image, they're just gray. There are lots of lines as the drum goes round and round. But here we can see first the P wave arriving, then the S wave arriving, in this case, then we have some surface waves. We've got surface waves, so we're probably relatively close to the earthquake. And the fact that the amplitude of this trace is relatively small for the P wave and S wave indicates that it's pretty low magnitude. Um, the amplitude or height of the waves, in other words, from up here to down here, is an indicator of the magnitude of the waves. And there's some links here. What I encourage you to do is go to the, the slides in D2L and follow these links to learn a bit more about um, earthquake instrumentation. I'm just picking um, one example here. One thing I want you to know, um, compare the trace on the right and the trace on the left. On the left, each of these traces is kind of rough. There's a lot of up and down. That's because seismometers also record other things that are going on. Um, if this, I'm trying to remember where this one is. Oh, Pavlov volcano. Okay, so there's probably some kind of storm going on. Um, they will often um, show the impact of high winds or really rough seas if you've got a seismometer near the ocean. Um, there are other things. Look here on the right. So this is data from, look at this, Ely, Minnesota. Um, and I acquired this last weekend, Sunday the 17th. And you may be looking at it going, what? An earthquake in Ely, Minnesota? Well, um, it is like an earthquake, but it isn't an earthquake. This will be some kind of quarry blast. Um, so if you go and search for earthquakes in Minnesota on one of the websites that I've given you a link to, you can go to Minnesota information and you can see a whole boatload of quarry blasts. 
So um, this is indeed a paper trail. And so this just helps visualize what now happens um, digitally. So now I want us to think about what happens when all those waves actually, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Um, all those waves pass through the surface beneath you. So first I want you to just look over on the left. What we've got here are six main hazards or types of damage. So there's ground motion, ground displacement, liquefaction, landslides, and tsunami. Then down here in green, all the hazards that are a consequence of how we build things, etc. cetera. Um, so first one we're gonna consider is ground motion or in everyday words, shaking. So take a look at this sort of three-dimensional diagram here. We've got land surface, and it's next to some water. And then in this block diagram, think of it as a cross section, we've conveniently got bedrock over on the left. And above that, we've got some well consolidated sediments. Then in this sort of slightly pinkish color, some poorly consolidated sediments. Then we go into bay muds or just water saturated sediment. Now, Look at this earthquake wave that is moving through these sediments. What I want you to notice is that as it changes from going through the bedrock all the way through to this bay mud, the amplitude, that's the height of the wave, and the periodicity increases. Periodicity is time between the arrival of the crests or the troughs of the wave, the peaks and the lows. So that effectively means that there's going to be much more damage in the bay muds. And that's because of how the waves interact with the bay muds. And you can see overall it increases through these different earth materials. So that increase in amplitude and periodicity results in much more shaking if you are built over here on the right. Um, there is a really good video that I encourage you to watch. So go to the slides, watch this video that narrates this property. So the amount of shaking or motion, if you like, is based in part on the wave type. It's also based on the distance from the focus and or the epicenter. So farther away, um, it less shaking. And as I mentioned, the changing earth materials chain, cause changes in wave frequency, think periodicity, and amplitude. And what's most important here is if we've got weaker sediments, such as the bay muds, we end up with a lower frequency, higher amplitude wave that is much more dangerous and causes much more shaking. Okay. Now let's think about ground displacement. So what is ground displacement? It's when we have a block of land that physically moves up or down or maybe from side to side. And that physical displacement is associated with a fault and the, um, location of that on the landscape is called a fault scarp. Now, a fault scarp is a cliff-like landscape feature where the fault reaches the surface. So in the center here, we're looking at a relatively new fault scarp. This was from an earthquake in Idaho 15 to 20 years ago. And you can see there's been probably about um, 10 to 15 
feat of vertical displacement on this fault. This is a new fault scar. On the other hand, here um, we are looking at an old eroded fault scarp. Now, um, if I was looking at this landscape, I would definitely notice this change in elevation. There are lots of potential causes for a steep, relatively steep slope and change in elevation. Um, I'd want to investigate them. I wouldn't instantaneously know that it was a, um, a consequence of a fault. But in this case, just accept that it is. In this case, it's related to the San Andreas fault. And you can see that it's, you know, it's been eroded. We can definitely see that transition from a flat surface up here to a flat surface down here. And there's a relatively steep slope. Um, so that's an older eroded fault scarp. And here we are, um, we're looking at, again, in this case, the San Andreas fault from the air this time. Again, this is a fault scarp. Now, there's a couple of different terms that people use for when a fault reaches the surface. Sometimes you'll hear the term a fault trace. Now, you may also hear the term surface rupture, and that's because those faults don't always reach the land surface. Um, they may kind of die out somewhere down below the surface. So having a surface rupture, like we saw in the previous slide from Idaho, that's, you know, that fault has reached the surface. It's a surface rupture. And then the term fault scarp. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm going to go to the document camera to take a look at um, strike slip faults. I hope. Okay, bear with me now. I just need to share. Okay, so what we're going to consider is strike slip faults. So a strike slip fault is here, we're going to consider two maps. So you are a bird flying along, looking down, directly down at the land surface. And there happens to be a distinct fault trace running across the landscape. That's what I'm labeling with F here. I don't know why it's going blue. Um, so that's a fault. Now, I'm going to put on this map. This line is a fence that has been displaced along that fault. And here's Another example of a fence that has been displaced along a fault. Now, let's take a look at the one over here, the one I'm pointing to right now. So when you look at this, what I'm hoping you can get a sense of is that the relative sense of movement of the blocks is now shown by these two arrows that I have drawn. So this example that I'm focusing on here with the arrows is an example of a left lateral 
strike, slip, fold. Um, and why is that? Well, what I want you to imagine is that you are standing on this block here. And when you look across the fold, the block on the other side, relatively speaking, has moved to the left. Convince yourself of that. Now, on the other hand, we're going to move over here now. And if you look at this simple map, I hope you can draw some arrows on it to show how that fence has been displaced. This is called a right lateral strike, slip, fault. And if you do the same thing that we did on the first map, you imagine you're just standing on this block, looking across to the other side. The block on the other side, relatively speaking, has moved to the right. Now, the beauty of this system, and this is where it can mess with your brain, it is still a right lateral strike slip fault if you're standing on the other side, looking back towards the side we were first on. It's still a right lateral strike slip fault. In fact, we can just turn this diagram around to convince you of that. There you are. So this example is our left lateral strike slip fault. Doesn't matter which side you were on. It is still a left lateral strike slip fault. This is our right lateral strike slip fault. We're looking at it from the other side. It's still a right lateral strike slip fault. The other important part of this is it doesn't matter which block does the moving and which block stays still or whether they're both moving at the same time. As long as, relatively speaking, the fence is displaced to the left, it's a left lateral strike slip. If it's displaced to the right, it's a right lateral strike slip fault. Doesn't matter which block is still, which block is moving. Okay, so that's strike slip faults. We're going to go back to the slides now and just bear with me here. So I need to come here and share. Okay, so we've looked at strike slip faults. And let's just, whoops, let's just practice. So over here on the right, we're in Japan. This is an image from the Geological Survey of Japan. And we've got some row crops um, conveniently displaced here. Take a moment to consider this. Is it a left lateral or right lateral strike slip fault? Pause. It is a right lateral strike slip fault. Here again, in this case, we've got some, um, I don't know what it is, um, that's been planted in rows. And the first thing you have to do is decide how the rows match up. I believe that the row I'm highlighting here matches with this one right here. So what is the sense of movement here. Pause. It is left lateral strike slip fault. 
because the row on the far side has moved to the left relative to where we are. Okay, so look over on the left at our list of hazards. Um, we've now discussed ground displacement and we're moving on to liquefaction. So what is liquefaction? Well, first of all, look at the image, poor guys, look at this image down here. What you're looking at is a car that is essentially buried in this goopy mud like stuff. So um, let's just look at the text over on the right now. So liquefaction is something that happens to loose sediment and waterlogged soils that effectively behave like a thick liquid when shaken. Um, so now there's two little diagrams up at the top here. So before getting shaken, we've got all these particles here. And in the pore space in between them, there's water. But when this unconsolidated sediment that has water in its pore space gets shaken, it behaves like a liquid and is kind of like a slurry. And that water um, sort of forces all those individual particles apart. And like I've said, it moves like a slurry. After the shaking stops, it will gradually settle down and you'll end up with this pile of mud and there'll be little pools of water like you see here in the front of the car. So um, let's move back to the right now. Um, this liquef liquefaction is um, obviously highly dependent on the type of material and on the type of seismic wave. Now, it's especially problematic near coasts. So if we're dealing with bay muds, for example. Um, and it is usually only um, a problem when there are um, near epicenters of really large earthquakes. So um, what are some of the consequences of liquefaction? Here's our list again, and we've got liquefaction. This is an image from Japan, major earthquake 7.5 in 1964 in Niigata. And what you're looking at here is a bunch of new apartment blocks that were built on, guess what, bay muds. And you can see that these apartment blocks are essentially, um, <laughs> you know, they, they're still coherent, they're solid but they were built on bay muds and they effectively just keeled over um, as a consequence of liquefaction and that amplification of earthquake waves. And there's two really good videos here. Um, I think it's the one at the bottom that do watch this. Um, the guy has a really thick New Zealand accent, but he's um, what he does is he shovels um, some of the liquefied mud out of his rose bed in the back garden, and he's carrying it in a wheelbarrow across some cobblestones to the road where the people doing earthquake cleanup will be collecting all this mud. But in the process of going over the cobbles, he mimics the liquefaction process. It's a wonderful example. So next up, we move to landslides. Now, first, a word about landslides. You'll see that I've put it in um, quotation marks here. That's because technically a landslide, um, if one's being really picky about classification and nomenclature in geology, landslides don't exist. But everyone uses the term, so I'm just going to go with it. It's the um, movement of um, large volumes of material downslope as a consequence of gravity. So um, here we have two 
landslides. Both of these were consequence of earthquakes. Now, it shouldn't be any surprise to you that um, landslides can be generated by an earthquake when there's a lot of shaking. So um, because we've already talked about um, earth, how earth materials respond differently to shaking. So let's just move over to the right hand side here for a moment. So obviously slope is important. Steeper it is, um, less stable the slope is. But then there's the material strength. Over on the left here, we've got a lot of sand and gravel and it moved down the slope. It was not very well consolidated and therefore not very stable. So it was effectively relatively weak. Now, um, if we move to the example on the bottom right, this is a major freeway in Taiwan. And the rocks here um, were essentially um, shales and mudstones that were kind of um, vertical. And so there were a lot of existing weaknesses. Now, another factor that was huge in this landslide was that there'd been a major typhoon the week before and the ground every, everywhere was completely saturated with water, which means that will more likely support the um, development of a landslide. And that together with the orientation of all the material um, was what caused this landslide. Okay, so now we're down to thinking about tsunami. So first of all, the word tsunami means big harbor wave. And what you often hear used for a tsunami is the word tidal wave. So technically, tidal wave is incorrect. Um, these earthquake generated waves have absolutely nothing to do with the tides. I'm going to repeat that. Uh, tsunami are nothing to do with tides. Um, they are generated by an earthquake. And um, because Japan is an island nation that has experienced many, many earthquakes and tsunami, they have a long history of artwork associated with tsunami over here on the left. On the right is one of the myriad of images that you might find online of um, a tsunami associated with the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. And here it's um, moving across a harbor wall. Now, if you go online, there are all sorts of absurd and totally ridiculous fake tsunami um, images. And this is just one example of the myriad of fake images of tsunami that you might find out there. Okay, so a little bit more about the Japan Tohoku earthquake from March 2011. Here are a couple of links, and I'm not sure both of them work properly, but you can you're perfectly capable of searching for links that show damage. Um, and make sure um, there's some pretty uh, harrowing footage out there. So um, watch closely about what you do and don't share with your students. Um, what we're going to think about now is, okay, here's Japan and what you're seeing with these dashed lines is the tsunami that was associated with the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, whoops, um, moved all the way across the Pacific. Look at that. It took just under 24 hours to reach the south coast of South America. <laughs> Chile, it also reached the west coast of the US. Now, this is um, potentially devastating. 
because if you're sitting happily somewhere along the West Coast in the Americas, you have absolutely no idea that there's just been a major earthquake in Japan. So you're sitting on the beach and then along comes this tsunami. So we actually have a pretty good tsunami warning system in the US and into Mexico, up in Alaska and in Hawaii. Um, and they've been improving them in South America. Now, let's look at how tsunami are generated. So they are generated by displacement of the sea floor. It's actually easiest to see in the bottom diagram down here. This red line represents a fault. And what you can see is the seabed is displaced along that fault. And that rupture is effectively what, if we go back up here to this diagram, that is what um, starts a tsunami. It's the um, displacement of the water caused by the um, ground displacement on the seafloor. That's what starts a tsunami. Now, when these tsunami are generated, um, let's, we're actually going, going to go down here. They have long periods. In other words, time between the crests and the troughs arriving. They are long period waves. They do travel fast, about 100 to 500 kilometers an hour. They also have low heights or amplitudes. And here's the caveat, until they reach shallow water. So once they reach shallow water, they become much shorter and much higher or taller. And there's actually um, specific metrics for how that works. So we're going to move to the next slide. So um, generally, when it's generated, a tsunami is a long wavelength, long period wave that um, has a low amplitude, in other words, a low height. Now, when you look at this diagram, the sort of pale brown color here is um, what we call the substrate. You can just imagine that it's beach sand that just extends down below the water. We'll call that the substrate. There's a specific rule about the point at which um, that substrate starts to impact how the water is behaving. And basically, if the water depth is more than half a wavelength, so more than half the distance from trough to trough or crest to crest, um, then nothing happens. But as soon as it gets into shallower water, those waves will start to steepen up, and you can see that here, and they get closer together. So that is what makes these tsunami um, so dangerous. They are fast moving and they steepen up and they get much closer together. But the other thing to think about is if we have incoming, incoming tsunami, then the water is all being forced towards the land. And normally, imagine you're just sitting at a beach and nothing much is happening. Water comes in with a wave and then it goes out. But with a tsunami, we just have wave after wave after wave coming in with great force. They're high, tall, and there's they're coming in relentlessly. That means that all the water that gets pushed up onto land can't go back. It's just being forced into the, onto the land by what's coming behind it. And that's, well, that's a huge problem, we could say. Okay, a little bit about tsunami warning systems. So way back in ooh, 2004, 2005, 
the big Indian Ocean earthquake um, was located here. We got Australia, Indonesia, um, Africa, and India. So uh, the epicenter was right here. The, the tsunami associated with this earthquake moved all the way across the Indian Ocean, and it absolutely devastated some areas on the east coast of India down into Sri Lanka. And um, so one of the, and over to East Africa as well. So one of the challenges here was there was not a really good tsunami, whoops, tsunami warning system. How do tsunami warning systems work? Well, this is a quite a complicated diagram, but the take home message is there's um, special buoys that get anchored to the ocean floor and they just float and they have all sorts of instrumentation on them. They are effectively connected to satellites and they will be able to identify a, um, a tsunami. And so that information can be um, communicated directly to the agencies that manage these tsunami wa uh, warning systems. And finally, we get on to human structures. Um, there's a lot out there about um, structures that are um, not, uh, how do I say this, um, that are not earthquake proof. So anything that is brick that doesn't have a um, structure that is holding those bricks, um, stopping them from collapsing during shaking is not good. Um, if we're out on a coastline, um, what happens now is a lot of buildings, especially in um, third world countries, will get built on stilts in order to, um, well, first of all, <laughs> deal with sea level rise, but also for tsunami. So once we're into areas in urban areas, like we are here, um, this building was built on bedrock, but look at how it's collapsed. There's, <laughs> there's girders kind of holding it up there. So what do we do now to build these enormous multi-story towers in places like Tokyo. We use something called base isolation. So essentially there's a foundation on whatever the um, solid, not bay mud, um, substrate is. But effectively there are these um, plates or base isolation bearings. And as you can see here, they can move sideways during an earthquake. And that means that as the waves go through, the whole building will just move a bit in whatever direction the earthquake um, wants it to move, shall we say, and it will remain intact. Um, but it's these um, base isolation bearings that um, can move backwards and forwards during that shaking. So finally, can we predict earthquakes? So here, this is very important. No, we cannot predict when an earthquake will occur. I'm going to repeat that. We cannot predict when an earthquake will occur. They are just sudden events without specific warnings. What we can do, however, is we can forecast earthquakes. Um, how do we do this? We use our understanding of tectonic setting, past earthquakes. We can use recurrence intervals and patterns. And so earthquake forecasting is like saying, how much of a hazard are earthquakes. And so what you're looking at on this diagram over here on the right is a US Geological Survey um, earthquake hazard map. And here it simply has highest hazard down to lowest hazard. And 
it shouldn't be any surprise to you that highest hazard are at these plate boundaries. So here we have convergent plate boundary up in Alaska, strike slip in California, and a sort of convergent plate boundary in um, Oregon and Washington. So that's no surprise. Here we are in Minnesota, low or lowest hazard. But what on earth is going on over here? I mean, this isn't anywhere near a plate boundary. Why it, do we have this area that's a higher hazard? Okay, very interesting. Let's think about that. So actually, I'm going to go back here. The area that I'm moving my cursor across right now is the New Madrid seismic zone. So here we are. This is the New Madrid seismic zone, just north of Memphis on the Mississippi River here. Up here we have St. Louis. Um, so let's look at um, why this is high hazard or higher hazard. So back in 1811 and 1812, there were three earthquakes. And from all the documentation that we have been able to lay our hands on, we know that they were all at least a magnitude seven. This is a piece of artwork from the time capturing some of the devastation. This must be the Mississippi River. And there's a really good Smithsonian article about this. Now, you may still be wondering, what is going on here? Why is this um, a big hazard zone? Well, um, think back to what we learned about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge when we were considering plate tectonics. Those ridges often get um, cut by a um, type of strike-slip fault. And um, the, some of those faults can extend quite a long way laterally. So if you look at the little inset map of the US here, you can see this zone here that has a um, higher hazard. So it's quite likely that that lines up possibly with one of those fracture zones. Now, there is also a whole bunch of geophysical data to show that way down below the sedimentary rocks in this area, there are some basement rocks and there's a really old fault that effectively runs sort of north, northeast to south, south, west that may also have seen some movement for some reason that we don't understand. But that's um, this kind of poorly understood New Madrid seismic zone. And I, this, I'm leaving this in here because there's a good link to learning about seismograms and earthquake data. Um, here's some more links, so use these when you look at the slides. The image I've got right up here is when I did a search for Minnesota earthquakes, and what I want you to take away is look at how they're all clustered up here where we've got a lot of the taconite mining. So those are quarry blasts. Some of the earthquakes, I think this one right here, or maybe even down here, is one of those really old um, magnitude four earthquakes that I don't think people really understand. So before we wrap up, um, there are a whole bunch of exercises you may find online about figuring out how far you are from an earthquake epicenter. And they use a bunch of graphs. So let's just interrogate this graph here. So on the x-axis, we've got distance to the epicenter in kilometers. And up at the top, there's a scale in miles. You just have to pay close attention to where these little 
barely visible ticks are. So on the y-axis, we've got what is called the PS interval. Um, this data gets presented in all sorts of different ways, but the PS interval is the difference in time between when the P wave arrives and the S wave arrives. Now, based on geophysical research, um, geophysicists and seismologists have shown that there is a direct correlation between the PS interval and how far we are from the epicenter. What that means is that a graph like this can be drawn. And this blue line represents the effectively the difference in the arrival of P and S waves, depending on how far you are from the epicenter. So if you can look at a seismogram, figure out the PS interval, you can then figure out how far away you are from the epicenter. So this is just all that in words. The distance to the epicenter is based on an established relationship between difference in S and P wave arrival times, gives us the distance to the epicenter. Now, this tells us how far from the earthquake epicenter our seismograph is, but it doesn't actually locate it. So what we have to do is called triangulation. We need three stations that measured the P and S wave from an earthquake. So here we are, and just like weather stations are, um, Seismometers have these um, weird um, I letter identifiers, and we've got three of them that we've picked out right here, D-U-G, I-S-C-O, W-U-A-Z. So we've got information from all three of those. So let me just get all these images up. So um, here are the steps that we go through to figure out exactly where the epicenter is. First of all, um, we calculate the SP lag. That's another um, phrase for the difference in SP um, arrival times. And as I've said before, the graphs that you see will vary. In this case, it has the SP interval on the X axis and the distance from the epicenter on the y-axis. So you always need to pay attention. And we've um, got that information now. Then we, um, so we've calculated it. Then now we're figuring out how far we are from each, each sorry, how far each station is from the epicenter. We've got our map. And we can get out our uh, compasses, if you're still allowed to have compasses at school, and you can draw a circle around each recording station using the scale here. And you know that the epicenter will be somewhere on that circle. Once you've done three of those, the place where all three of those circles overlap is the epicenter. Okay, more um, links to consequences of earthquakes. I think all these work. And we are done with our investigation of earthquakes. So thank you very much. Um, next week, or well, this week, we'll be working on water. We'll be working on streams, floods, and groundwater. A whole lot. We'll see you then. Bye.